Are you <coughs> Am I what government? So what you just said, this beauty and stuff, do you think that is a parallel within our U.S. government? Uh, a sense of appreciation and value for nature, what our founders considered to be nature's God, that appreciation was in the spirit of the writing of the founding legal documents for this country. They wanted freedom. They lived and worked by honest measures. And they were simple people who were well read and knowledgeable when they framed the Constitution based on the Articles of Confederation and the Declaration of Independence. They were <clears throat> keenly aware and they put the wording into the Declaration about unalienable rights. That we come into this world, the way I like to phrase it is, we enter here through the bone gates of birth, carrying with us unalienable rights, that no man-made government has any authority to subjugate or to take from you. They come from, in the Founders' words, nature's God. Government <clears throat> is like a necessary evil in my point of view, and you want some consensus among the people who live on the land. You want this consensus so that you can build a community school. Say that again. You're fine. <clears throat> <clears throat> government is like a contradiction to freedom. The root word in government is to govern. Uh, to govern is to control or regulate, to maintain a external will over the functioning of anything that you're governing, including people. So government has this innate capacity to control people. People, on the other hand, who created that government, really, at the time they created our present federal government, they really didn't want a lot of control. So they limited the power of government in Article One, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. They limited that. They enumerated its powers. They granted those powers, and then by the Ninth and Tenth Amendments in the Bill of Rights, they reminded the federal government, if it's not in Article I, Section 8, it is reserved to the states or to the people. And when they said or to the people, they didn't say and to the people. And the reason is this, the people because of our founders' love for freedom, the people were designated as the ultimate source of authority. The founders recognized that those source of authority is from that higher source that pre preserved in us at birth our unalienable rights. So the people empower their state and the states came together and empowered the general government in Washington, D.C. At the time of this nation's founding, the 13 states were each sovereign nation-state republics. They had their own constitutions, their respective uh, weights and measures, their, their monetary system, their, their legal codes, everything, each state that had previously been a colony, upon its success, success in getting out from under British rule, established its own sovereignty. But the states themselves were dependent upon the people who lived on the land, who worked with their hands, who created the wealth, who regulated their own lives. Those states came together some years after the Articles of Confederation and did what James Madison turned into a constitutional convention to create this
Constitution for the United States. So the states created the, the, the federal government by signing the Constitution. If you look on the Constitution itself, there is no signature there representing the general government or the federal government. There was no signature. Nobody there could sign for the government because it didn't exist until the states and compact created the thing. So <clears throat> Article 1, Section 8 tells the government what it will do. It will build these postal roads so we can have interstate highways. Dwight Eisenhower started this uh, national defense system, but that's lawful under the Constitution because it can be said to be postal roads. Who hasn't seen a postal truck going down the highway? They, they can have military bases in the several states. They buy the land from the states and erect a military base. They have certain, certain things that they are to do for the protection of our rights, our liberty, our freedom, our economic existence as a nation state as a union of nation states and they but they cannot do more than what they're told to do in article 1 section 8 a and the people themselves reserve that ultimate authority that sovereignty and they each one of us takes a little bit of sovereignty out of his own soul and sends it into the pool with everybody else who all want to see a road or a school for the community so that the parents can go to work, the kids are in school, they're being taught by people who live in their community, and this is a good use of government. But government that grows and centralizes power that originally was designated to be sourced to three different co-equal branches in what the founders call a system of checks and balances. Once that government has grown large enough and powerful enough and employs arms for the enforcement of its edicts, its statute laws, and even in any, any legitimate laws it may have, at that point it can force on the local community federally mandated tenants for educating our children. At that point, the people are no longer happy. The consensus is we've got too much government. It is too intrusive. It's affecting my wallet. It's now wanting to teach my children immoral, unethical value systems that are by chance compliant with the dictates of Karl Marx and ultimately communism. What so, happens? <clears throat> what happens? Where, in your opinion, do we really, really start to go off? The, um, there's, there's not a simple answer to where did this all start from. We, we know that there was debate in the Constitutional Convention itself about the nature of the, the nation, the new nation's banking system. Some wanted a central bank, some did not. Thomas Jefferson did not want the federal government to be granted the power to, to borrow money, for instance. But he and Madison were overruled by, by majorities during the convention on several, several points. But by the time Andrew Jackson was president, the central bank was a severe problem, and Jackson killed it. And it took them 77 years after his administration to get another central bank into America. That's called your Federal Reserve System Incorporated. And that's... Uh, the IRS? No. <clears throat> the Federal Reserve is distinct from the IRS. However, the IRS was a requirement of the bankers who coerced Congress and, the, and President Wilson to sign this Federal Reserve Act into law. The IRS was required 
by the same bankers to guarantee the payment of the interest on the loans the Federal Reserve would create for the federal government. Now, the Federal Reserve is a for-profit corporation, privately owned, in a relationship that furnishes the currency for the United States government for the Treasury Department. <clears throat> Prior to 1913, when we got the Federal Reserve and the Internal Revenue Service, there was no federal income tax. And America had prospered. The individual American was free to build his own future, to extend the power of his own mind into creative and fruitful work. He could start a business. He could employ people. He could generate the economy in his sphere. In a nutshell, they were doing all right. The American people were prosperous. They were peaceful and they were happy. The first war of imperialism was 1898, the Spanish-American War. Prior to that, there was no adventures abroad, as George Washington would have called it. So <clears throat> to pay the interest on the debt that the Federal Reserve would create, a tax upon the income of the American people was brought to bear. They did pass the 16th Amendment, granting them an authority which is challenged today. It's challenged, in fact, by several Supreme Court judgments. But... <clears throat> what is that, again, what's challenged? In, in, you know, summarize... Well, the Constitution grants the federal government the power to tax just about anything. But it has to be an apportioned tax. An unapportioned tax is where if you make $50,000 a year and he makes $100,000 a year, you don't pay as much taxes as he does. You each are charged or assessed a different tax payment liability. That's not constitutional. The way it would be constitutional is if every working American who drew an income would pay not a percentage of his income, but a set apportioned fee, $5 per month per worker. $15, whatever it would be. Why is it not that way? But it is not that way because the Federal Reserve owners needed the ability to deceive the American people. They first started off your tax, if you're a working person and you're an average income type American, your first <clears throat> obligation is. Uh, going to be very, very small. But if you're a fat cat on Wall Street or you own several businesses, you're going to pay more. Whether something about an unconscious middle class group mind finds that appealing, you'll hear it today in the newspapers. This one politician or another is talking about raising taxes, but he's going to talk about raising taxes on the rich, not the poor. Okay, this is a popular kind of idea that unawakened citizens generally entertain in their in their own minds. Because it never happens that way. <clears throat> well, very rarely, right? Well, there are people now who are getting what is it called unearned income tax refunds that they didn't even pay in. the uh, The whole tax thing is a sad circus anymore. The IRS has turned into a very brutal and confiscatory operation or arm of the general government, a and it, it is not a respecter of persons. Uh, it's a it's a it's an infrastructure of government. <clears throat> Why do you care about all this? Are you a constitutionist? Would you consider yourself a constitutionist or 